think it looks like this is a good time to get started. All right, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, this event billed as Humanizing the Climate Conversation, Hearing and Telling Local Climate Stories to Make Global Change. Today, we're joined by a panel of three international climate journalists. Um, but before I get into that, I would like to introduce Lisa Fernandez, who's going to say a few words about the Yale Center for Environmental Communications. Right. Thanks a lot, Tom. And thank you, all three of you, Nabila, Lena, and Eric, for joining us today. I just want to mention briefly that this is officially hosted by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication, which is a relatively new strategic initiative at the school um, designed to specifically focus on environmental communications. And there are four pillars to our programming. The first is, of course, research, which is fundamental to everything we do because it uh, provides us with data and insights that we can then share with the climate movement and also with the environmental movement more broadly to help with evidence-based advocacy. We also have a lot of faculty and affiliated faculty that are teaching various aspects of strategic environmental comms, including um, the director of the YPCCC, which is the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, which is of itself a unit of the Yale Center for Environmental Communication in the spring, he teaches a course on um, strategic environmental communication, which I'm seeing several students here that have taken that course in the past. Um, and then thirdly, we, uh, we uh, work a lot on convening um, people from around the world. This is an example of that, uh, where we are really trying to build up a network of uh, environmental communicators, you know, all across the globe, really. Um, that are working on a lot of these aspects of strategizing, um, pushing forward an environmental agenda. And this includes, for example, presenting at the uh, Global Conference of the Parties at the, at the UN, um, which we hope to be able to do uh, this year, or not, not this year, next year in Glasgow, which will be the 26th convening. Um, and then fourthly, we are definitely engaged in a lot of different journalism initiatives at the school. Um, probably most famously the award-winning E360, which has been a longtime champion of analysis and opinion and reporting in the environmental domain, um, as well as a lot of wonderful student-led initiatives like the Environmental Film Festival, the Literary Sage Magazine, and um, the YER, the Yale Environment Review, which does where students gather and translate a lot of cutting-edge research done at Yale in the environmental field for more of a lay audience. So uh, I just wanted to you know, welcome you all and we're so honored um, at the Yale Center for Environmental Communication to be able to host you for this conversation. Now back to you, Tom. Thank you. Um, and now before we get started with the presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce our three panelists today. First, we have Nabila Shapir. She's a British Pakistani journalist. She shared a British journalism award in 2015 with the Keep It In The Ground movement or excuse me, with the Keep It In The Ground team at The Guardian. The campaign, unique in its kind for a legacy newspaper in the United Kingdom, asked the two biggest philanthropic organizations in the country to divest from fossil fuels. She's a conversational editor at The Correspondent, a transnational media group based in Amsterdam, where she works to help tell the story of climate change from the perspective of those who have lived and experienced it from around the world. Next, we have Eric Holthaus, who is a meteorologist and climate journalist in St. Paul, Minnesota. His work focuses on the need to simultaneously draw attention to the systematic injustice and pressing dangers of the climate emergency and build transformative change in an ecologically focused society that works for everyone. He recently, recently launched a Substack newsletter about the climate emergency called The Phoenix, which covers all the way the world is on fire and in the process of being reborn. And last up, we have Lena Yassin. She is a Sudanese climate journalist. She is the Middle East and North Africa programs tracker for, excuse me, programs manager for Climate Tracker, a international organization that empowers young journalists to cover climate issues in their countries. With Climate Tracker, Lena has implemented various mentorship programs in the Arab region and has established a network of over a thousand climate journalists in the region. Wow, so some very exciting panelists we have today. I will be now sharing my screen so we can all look at this slideshow that they have prepared together. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, okay. So whenever anyone wants to jump in. 
so I can get started. So I want to immediately downplay all expectations for this slideshow. It is the anti-design job, <laughs> copy-paste, copy-paste drama of my life and trying to bring you the best ideas um, when Tom first got in touch and told us he'd like to do this session. So thanks very much for having us here. Um, and it's also lovely to be here with Eric and Lena, who are, um, I think one thing that you learn when you're working on climate communication is that you pick up just the, the greatest friends along the way. So it's just an honor to be working with them too. But to speed on to my incredibly sophisticated slideshow, um, uh, I wanted to talk about the work that I did five years ago, which might seem like a long time when it comes to climate communication, but I would say it was the moment when I had the, the most amount of sort of financial incentive behind a media campaign. Um, which was called Keep It in the Ground. Um, and this was uh, something that we launched, an editorial campaign at The Guardian, um, because the editor-in-chief was leaving after 20 years and he realized that journalism is too often a, a, um, a rear view mirror kind of situation. And if the biggest story of our time is climate change, um, why isn't it on the front page of the news all the time? Um, and so we had to settle on a, a kind of messaging. How do you actually relay that to to regular newspaper readers, digital media readers. And so we settled on the uh, on that core message that, you know, a large proportion of the oil, coal and gas reserves that state and companies, states and companies already hold have to stay untapped in order to avoid dangerous climate change or essentially it'd be catastrophic to burn most of the fossil fuels in the ground. And we did that in a traditional way by having investigative journalism. So we reported from the Arctic, from China, from Brazil, from Australia and South Africa with local correspondents. Um, but the other main thing that we also did was launch a campaign in partnership with 350.org, which is the NGO that you all uh, probably know. And so Bill McKibben, who uh, US environmentalist, was a huge inspiration. He, he leads this US-based climate group. Um, and so we worked together to focus on divestment, another very challenging thing to kind of bring to your audiences. But the main idea behind this campaign was to target institutions, uh, universities, pension funds, faith organizations, and ask them to move their investments out of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and 350 has signed up more than 1,100 investors who have pledged this. And we decided to pick, as Tom mentioned earlier, two main, uh, the two biggest philanthropic organizations. And of course, you all know Bill Gates, who's you know, billionaire, Microsoft co-founder, and one of the world's most prominent uh, philanthropists. So if we move to the next slide, um, some of the things which we did for the climate change campaign, which ran for much of 2015 in the run up to the now historic Paris climate change agreement, um, was about communicating these ideas to the audiences in lots of different formats and lots of different ways. I really got the chance to, to be involved with it at all aspects. And of course, language is really important. And I think from the very get go, making people understand why we're doing this. And so we kept, we, we didn't want to have a person as the figurehead of the campaign. But logically, it did make sense that a departing editor in chief after two decades of having all this sort of platform should explain, you know, perhaps again and again, what journalism is good at and how we can make it work with climate change. And of course, part of that is breaking down constantly. What, what does two degrees mean? You know, why keep it in the ground? What, what are fossil fuels? What, you know, what impact do they have? And so language was really, really important. And I, I, I mean, five years on, I would say that I might be biased, but I think we, um, it's not that we own those terms now, but I feel like there's definitely a much bigger awareness among readers generally um, about those terms. And so if we move on to the next slide, um, one of the coolest things that I could do there as well was um, think about how to internationalize this kind of um, this story. And we launched um, something called the Climate Publishers Network and it was created by us at The Guardian, El País, which is the main newspaper in Spain, and a group called the Global uh, Editors Network. And so we gathered together 40 newspapers from all around the world, you know, the Huffington Post or Bolivian newspaper or, you know, um, uh, the China Daily. And the idea was that without syndication and without um, thinking about it too much, we would just share each other's stories with each other. Uh, and I think this kind of um, idea of collaboration and working together and spreading the knowledge really, really was quite uh, important. I even got a tiny translation budget at The Guardian to make sure that if El Monde, uh, Le Monde published something, we could translate it and vice versa. Um, and so, 
you know, when, when I spoke to other people in the network, it was actually up to them whether they uploaded their stories or not. Um, the idea is that, um, you know, for some of them, there's a lack of momentum on climate change in their countries, if it's Argentina or whatever, for others, it's a lack of resources. And so this was one really important way that we communicated together across languages and in collaboration with all syndic syndication fees dropped uh, until the final day of the Paris um, uh, summit. If we move on to the next slide, um, here's when things started to get a bit more interesting. Uh, we launched a podcast called The Biggest Story in the World. And um, this was a way of keeping ourselves, keeping our own feet to the fire and trying to understand what we were trying to do. Uh, Cause it's no big feat, I think in, in sort of one year to pull together such a complex topic, uh, which also comprises a campaign. Journalists are not generally campaigners. Um, especially around the topic of divestment. And so the podcast, you can, you're free to, to go and listen to it. We, we chose different episodes which focused on things such as economics, you know, what are the maths of keeping it in the ground? What would happen to the global economy if we turned away from fossil fuels? We got to look at psychology. Um, so we called in for one episode. So we called in social scientists and artists and psychologists to try and discuss whether a newspaper could actually succeed at journalism if journalism has failed in communicating the story of climate change, you know, how can we all work together to, to move in a different direction? What other uh, places can we learn from? And we had episodes around, you know, the impact of the, of the campaign, what kind of criticism we were getting. You know, a lot of people weren't happy that we were talking about climate change every single day. Um, and also the, the huge influence that the US has. So that was also um, a major episode that we did. Uh, the next slide. Um, this is a cheeky one um, and perhaps very British to an organization, but um, it's, it's very hard, I think, when you launch a campaign about divestment to sign up instantly the biggest names in the field. We eventually did manage to get some kind of um, uh, awareness around it, but one other way of creatively, uh, uh, you know, approaching the idea of who could be your ambassador when it comes to climate communication was actually inviting lots of acting talent to read poetry about climate change. And so we got the UK Poet Laureate to gather together a list of poems. And it was my humble task to find people like James Franco or people who'd expressed an interest in the environment and who were doing their own activism to join us. Um, and so that was really fun. And the last example I'll have from The Guardian is in the next slide. And this was just uh, lots of little motion animation videos that we did. Uh, they were all 60 seconds. Um, you know, why does the Paris Climate Summit have to succeed? You know, can the Republicans halt climate change? Do you have to be a vegan if you want to, you know, help fix climate change? And so completely different visuals and messaging. But I think the point of doing these videos showed that you could talk about very complex topics actually in a minute. You could get the main idea across and you could break down a lot of ideas and show people how uh, climate affects their lives. Um, and so I'll move on from this Guardian campaign and I can talk about it. I'm, I'm aware we don't have much time. I'm now at The Correspondent. So uh, I spent the last year working with Eric, uh, who I was very excited about hearing was joining The Correspondent um, because he's just done an incredible amount of work five years on, I mean, for me at least, and when thinking about climate and how we talk about the crisis. And so he published a mission statement and we tried to find different ways to approach um, climate coverage. So I'll speak a little bit about what Eric's done at The Correspondent before him. And so part of that was, for example, book reviews, um, which I, I find is a very accessible way for people to talk about topics, which might be a bit difficult to, again, visualize on a day-to-day -day basis. If you go to the next slide, um, I find that in climate communication, we're always coming back to the idea of re-explaining very core ideas and issues. And this is why Eric signed up to do a bunch of explainers about the global meth methane crisis, about what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef. And I'm gonna do a shout out to Lena here as well, because um, from her home in Khartoum, she's been collaborating with us over the last year as a member always to try to think about how we can access those voices which we're not hearing the most of, which is I think what she'll also talk about with you guys today. So she's actually part of a story which is on the homepage today um, and uh, where we've talked to young climate activists from all around the world. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, that 
bringing in all of those voices of people who are just doing the most exciting things is actually the way we should be going. I think five years ago at The Guardian, we were a group of people quite privileged, sitting in a sort of tower um, and doing our best to reach out and, and including members from all over the world in our campaign. But I think the real truth of the, the issue is to actually hear from those who are indeed experiencing climate change. They know it better. And so here you see some examples of uh, wonderful profiles that Eric has done within his network, of really inspiring people um, and a group of indigenous leaders of all ages um, from all over the world. And I think keeping that conversation going, because that's my job, conversation editor, is the most important thing. So I think that's all from me on these slides. I'll hand over to Eric. Thank you so much, Nabila. Um, I, uh, it's been such an honor to work with you. Um, yeah, I am transitioning now from uh, the correspondent to working on this um, Substack publication called The Phoenix. Um, and it's a, it's a newsletter, but um, in the same way that, um, that, you know, social media or, um, or blogging, you know, back in the day um, was considered sort of independent media. Um, I, I'm viewing this this uh, um, this uh, newsletter, the Substack, um, as uh, an opportunity to um, sort of, for the very first time in my journalism career, um, be a uh, have a totally independent media. Um, platform where I can sort of shape my own climate journalism however I see fit, which is really an interesting and creative place to be in and um, only would have <laughs> happened um, after, you know, learning so much from so many different organizations over the last 10 years that I've been doing journalism. Um, so um, what I'm trying to do um, uh, with the Phoenix is really um, uh, blend, so I, I've, I, I think I've had, let's say like five major um, roles uh, as a climate journalist over the last 10 years. Um, I started as a climate scientist um, working at Columbia uh, University um, on climate change adaptation, um, um, partnering with communities around the world, mostly in um, the Caribbean and in East Africa, focused on um, agriculture and drought and figuring out ways uh, that, that we can use um, weather and climate information like forecasts and, and um, satellite estimates of rainfall um, to, to make communities, um, to give tools to make communities more resilient um, in uh, when, when climate disasters hit like droughts or floods. Um, and, um, and so that, um, my, you know, my job in that was to go uh, to communities to so sort of work with um, local organizations and just have uh, large meetings of, you know, sometimes like five to 50 people where we would just talk about what does climate change mean for you? What happens when there's a drought? What happens when there's a flood? What, what do you do? What are your coping mechanisms? How do you respond? Um, and, you know, I did that for six years, um, going around the world, ho hosting those conversations and trying to blend the, in this, these sort of messy, complex, lived realities of people at the front lines of climate change with, you know, uh, cutting edge climate science and trying to figure out how to make sure that when we try to help, that we are not actually causing more harm. Um, it, and when I say we, I mean, um, you know, Ivy League scientists and journalists, <laughs> uh, people who um, started uh, to do this work because we care so much about climate change, realizing um, maybe not quite quickly enough that climate change um, affects everything, every part of everyone's life all around the world, um, from food to finance to um, transportation to communication, to who gets a voice and who doesn't get a voice. Um, and I think that is, is kind of what, um, what I've learned most over the last uh, 10 years or so is that, um, is that um, 
the climate story is not a story about, you know, like climate denial or um, who holds the who holds the US Senate and what laws can be passed. Um, it's about people and how they live and how they respond and who gets the chance, who gets the ability to survive and thrive and who doesn't really, it's about justice. So, um, and I don't think there is uh, anything wrong. In fact, I think that we're probably doing malpractice as journalists if we don't tell the story that way, because that's to me what the, what the real story is. Uh, distracting from those lived experiences is sort of a way of prolonging the um, impacts of climate change. If we're not, you know, as, as Nabila said, if we aren't treating climate change as the most important story in the world and, and focusing um, focusing what um, happens through all um, aspects of life, uh, then we're not going to be telling the, the full story. We're not going to be able to find solutions at work. So, um, so, so I started, um, I started uh, writing uh, about 10 years ago, a weather blog for the Wall Street Journal, um, understanding uh, what what uh, people, it was focused on New York City. What, what do people in New York City care about the weather? And I realized um, it, you know, the weather is a, is, a, is a human interest story more so than it is a story about statistics or, um, or disaster or recovery. Um, this was the same uh, period of time that Hurricane Sandy hit. Uh, so I was doing a lot of, of reporting about, um, uh, recovery from Sandy uh, realized, you know, as a as a scientist and a very young journalist, that um, this is not going to be an easy job where I just go and like share pretty weather maps and give my give my forecast uh, and expect people to sort of pay attention. You have to you have to you have to uh, learn about your audience that you're talking uh, to. Um, um, uh, and then after that, I I worked for Slate. Um, which is kind of the total opposite of the Wall Street Journal, uh, where um, Slate is focused on opinion and, and culture. And, um, and I learned that, um, I learned how to write a, sort of in a contrarian way or, or learn that, um, that, that often um, whatever the opinion uh, is of the day, you know, often um, when there's a big climate news day, um, everyone will write different versions of the exact same story. And I would train myself while I was writing for Slate to say, what if the opposite is true? What if we're missing this story? What if everyone is just repeating the, the same line, but the real story is the opposite of that. So for example, um, if there's a new, if there was news about um, the Arctic or something, uh, everyone would say like, "Well, it's too late." You, you know, uh, the we've passed the tipping point. There's no possible way of recovery now. This was in 2014, 2015. Uh, clearly, that's not true. You know, like we're still here. <laughs> you know, it's not an it's not an apocalypse every single day. So, um, so I would I would write a story like uh, no just say like, no, the, uh, the Arctic is not doomed or something like that. And then, you know, like I would be the only one that would have that story that day and everyone would be interested in like, okay, what's the other side of the story? Um, so that was helpful for me in my career as a journalist to learn um, that, that whatever everyone else saying isn't always true. Um, and after that, I went to, um, um, I went uh, to to Grist, uh, which is uh, an environmentally focused um, uh, newspaper, one of the oldest um, websites actually uh, focused on news um, that started in the late 90s. Um, and so they have 20 years of talking about climate and focusing on climate journalism. Um, I learned that, um, in that amount of time, they have evolved um, from telling climate change as an environment story, as a as a um, as a, a something that's separate from people, to something that is a justice story. Fundamentally, that that there is no way of separating people from the environment. That's just sort of like a 
a construct in our, our minds that uh, we, we literally can't exist without the environment. So therefore, you know, the climate is inherently a human story, not, a, not something separate uh, from humanity. And at the correspondent, um, I learned to tell the story with a global perspective and that there are, um, there are similar stories happening in every country. Uh, uh, and just because you don't know a whole lot about um, the daily news uh, cycle in, in Spain or in Argentina or in um, Nepal, it doesn't mean that the news cycle there is not very complex and nuanced just like it is in the United States or wherever it is you're from. Um, and, you know, sort of learning how to tell stories that um, are fundamentally true, you know, sort of over throughout the world, but still have um, this, uh, this nuance of everyone's uh, lived experience. So, um, and the, the book that I wrote <laughs> for over the last five years, The Future Earth, tries to kind of um, project all of this forward um, over the next 30 years and ask the question of what, uh, what happens, what does it feel like when we, when we create the change that's necessary, uh, that scientists say is necessary on, on climate change? Um, how do we get to a net zero carbon world by 2050? What does it look like dec decade by decade as that transition is happening? So um, trying to sort of throw out a big picture idea of a just transition and my my blog that or my Substack newsletter, the Phoenix, is um, is sort of like a more day by day version of that same story. Um, how do we talk about a just transition as it's happening? Um, and my goal for that is again to to tell the climate change story as a human story um, because that's what it is. So um, I think that. Uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about Lena um, and um, I met her at the correspondent um, uh, and, and worked with her on a, a couple of stories there. Uh, it's been, it's been really interesting to um, again um, be challenged by um, by this idea that uh, I think in our, our first um, video uh, call that we had together, um, uh, Lena asked the question of what what would it be like if we told the climate change story fundamentally from uh, Sudan's perspective or fundamentally from um, from Pakistan's perspective or from another country that's not the United States, basically. How would that change your mind with the way you tell stories if if Sudan was the center of the world, everything we had to, everything we were doing had to pass through Sudan. What, like, how would we care about the climate change story differently? And that has really helped me to understand how I might be able to tell um, stories that are more true, that are more um, focused on 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 not what not the idea that I have in the head of climate change, but what climate change actually means for people. Thank you so much, Eric and uh, Nabila. It's great to link up with you again. And just like Nabila said, I think um, one of the nicest things about climate advocacy is that along the way, you keep making friends and meeting uh, inspiring individuals, and they just stay with you forever. I I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so. And thank you again, Tom, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here with you again, uh, with you here. And um, so I'm going to talk about um, um, what the work that I do on climate change. Uh, I don't come from a uh, journalism background. so. And the reason I actually started writing about climate change was quite personal. And this is why in my work right now, I tend to write about climate change from a human perspective and um, really focusing, uh, focusing on the science. And that's because um, I, I got interested in climate change and my passion for it started, I would say in 2013, uh, because that year Sudan was hit by uh, one of its massive flash floods uh, and it actually impacted thousands of people. And at the time, floods weren't a new thing, like, and, and I've seen it before, but the difference that time was, uh, is that I did not read about it. I did not watch it on the news. I saw it. So it really did hit my city. 
and I volunteered um, at, a, uh, at an organization that um, helped the victims of the floods. So it was a life changing experience for me because I finally saw with my eyes and felt how this is um, how this is bad and how this impacts people because over one over a night people's lives changed. They lost their homes, they lost their family members, they lost their, their source of income. So that was shocking for me and I wanted to know why this is happening and how could we better um, deal, with, deal with it basically. So I started reading more and that's how I got to know about climate change and I was very confused about the fact that I've never heard of it or at least like I vaguely knew it and that's when I realized that if I don't know it then a lot of people in my community don't know it and this is this is urgent like we need to know it. So I started, I was, I was in school at the time, high school, so I started a mini magazine um, talking about climate change and how, how we as students need to know more about it and how can we communicate it. Um, it started off as a mini project and I highly doubt anyone read the magazine for the first few um, editions, but then the project got exciting and more people started joining. And it really became like a, a thing that everyone looks um, looks at, is excited for for next week. Like, what are we going to write about? Yes, climate change, but climate change and what? So I think I created that passion with me again when I entered university, and um, I realized again that even my university, which is I think one of the uh, the top university in, in in Sudan, people rarely know about climate change, and even those who vaguely know it are not that interested in in it. So. I think that made me realize that if I want to communicate climate change, um, terms like um, greenhouse gases, um, emissions, UNFCCC, are not going to get to people's mind because, um, and I think this applies to, to Sudan and maybe other um, developing countries, but really people have a lot going on in their daily life already. So communicating climate change um, in a way that makes them concerned about it needs to be in a language and in a way that really touch them, really touch their lives. So I think you can't write about pure, you can't write an article purely about climate change and expect people to care because they're not going to be able to link it to their daily life and thus it's not going to be as important for them like they will tell you that they have to worry about other issues like politics and economics so and this is fair so the, the way for me was to always try to find a way to speak to people to my audience understand them and understand what really touched them and then talk about it from that perspective so I started writing more and more, and I finally, in 2016, I'm um, Climate Tracker, the organization which I work in right now, had an uh, online mentorship uh, opportunity open, uh, which helps you communicate climate change. They teach you how to write about climate change, basically, and how to pitch your, your articles uh, to editors. So I joined the mentorship, which is very exciting, and I really learned a lot about journalism. Like I, I was just writing as an activist, so they really taught me. Um, um, they taught. taught taught me some really essential skills um, that helped me develop my writing. And in a matter of weeks, I managed to actually publish in uh, like big newspapers in my country. And like I managed to actually get editors to listen to me. And then that's when I started exploring audiences. I finally, um, I started realizing that Sudan is really big and there's a lot of audiences. So one time I wrote an article about climate change and its impact on agriculture and how this is basically going to impact the income of a lot of people and like and how um, farmers may lose their source of income and I was um, and someone wrote back to me saying that um, he doesn't believe in what I wrote or at least he's skeptical about it because from a religion um, that's not true we should not be questioned is that um, that made me realize that um, this is actually true like a lot of people in Sudan are very religious and they think from a religious perspective. So I need to talk to them in that way. So what I did is that um, I started reading more about how I can link climate change to Islam and how I can basically convince people that um, this is not um, just a plan from God and that actually um, from an Islamic perspective, uh, we were told to preserve earth and protect it. So right now climate change is us destroying earth. So I started using that narrative and I realized, and I like once I started publishing more about climate change from an Islamic perspective, um, like even the outreach the reach for my articles and the number of engagement really changed a lot because I finally got people to talk about things that they wanted, they are interested in. So I think that was um, a life changing experience for me as well. And then um, after, uh, in 2016, after that mentorship ended, um, I joined Climate Tracker uh, in the first, uh, in my first COP, the Conference of the Parties, and it was COP 22. It was in Marrakesh, Morocco. So that was my first um, ever global experience uh, about climate change and basically getting to know the climate negotiations and climate policies. 
So that was a whole new field that I started exploring uh, in 2016. And I realized that this is really big and no one in Sudan knows about it. No one knows how this is, uh, how these basically meetings and negotiations are going to impact our future or like the, uh, our future in Sudan. Because right now, like even when I read about it, they talk about it from a global perspective. So what I started doing is that I started writing about these negotiations in a very simple language um, and it's a very simple way. And just basically tell people how a, whole, a meeting with global, um, with countries from all over the world is going to impact your life. It's going to impact your income. It's going to impact your future. And um, after 2016, um, Climate Tracker, uh, they asked me to join their team because they wanted to expand in the Arab region. Um, and I was very happy to do so because I also wanted to uh, basically try to go on a more regional level and, um, and then potentially international. So I joined the team in 2017 and that's when we started um, um, conducting campaigns and programs in the Arab region. And we immediately realized that linking up with journalists and young communicators in that region is very tough. And that's because frankly, there's a lot going on in that region and like politics is the main, um, is the main topic in the region. Like uh, there's always a war about to break out in that region. So journalists are really interested in, in talking about that. And they, and they view environment and climate as a secondary topic. And whenever they talk about it is that it's now just related to a, a topic, a, a political topic at the moment, but they never really think about climate change um, as a priority. So what we started doing is that we started conducting a series of mentorships and uh, online campaigns and workshops um, where we invite to see a bunch of journalists from different countries, or sometimes we do local workshops uh, in one country. And we basically train those journalists about how they can link climate change in their work. So, and we even faced a lot of um, back and forth with journalists where they said, um, okay, climate change sounds important, but um, my editors want me to write about interesting topics that get um, readership. So how can I do that? Like um, I need a job and I need to keep my job. So how, how do I link that? Uh, and that's basically what we, uh, we tried to do is that we try to help them link climate change to their topic and slowly started, um, start in introducing it in their articles and in their writings. And actually some of the uh, journalists that we've worked with ended up um, being becoming the environmental correspondents for their newspapers, because that's how, like they managed to convince the editors that we need a section on climate change. We need a section, a section on environment, and eventually they develop to that role. Uh, so we continue doing that, and I'm still doing that. And um, our network has, um, over the years, has expanded. So far, we've reached over a thousand um, members in the Arab region, um, journalists and activists. And just last, um, just last month, uh, this picture that you guys see here is actually from a workshop that we conducted in Sudan, uh, and it was about climate change uh, communications and energy transition. Uh, and uh, we had about 20 members who most of them are journalists, young journalists and activists. And we basically um, taught them how they can communicate climate change. And we even talked about climate policies like the COP, um, uh, Paris Agreement, the, the upcoming COP in Glasgow and how all of these matter to Sudan and why. And then basically asked them to write about it. So even um, out of the 20 um, participants that uh, took part in the workshop, five, five of them are actually working on investigative reports related to climate change um, and energy in Sudan. So this is and the fact that I got to work with these kind of projects is really exciting. And then the second picture that you see is actually uh, in a campaign with Greenpeace um, MENA region. Uh, we cl I collaborated with them uh, last month. They started this project uh, called Oma for Earth. Oma is the Arabic word for nation. And basically what this project aims to do is um, it aims to communicate with um, Arabic, um, uh, with Arabic leaders uh, and Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, environmental activists and just Arabic youth to teach them more about climate change, but speak their language. So the whole project is, uh, is purely in Arabic and we're only talking about uh, climate change from an Islamic perspective. So we recorded a video where we asked um, young Arab people to tell us, their, uh, ask us question about uh, climate change and what do they think about it? And even if they want us to teach them how climate change is linked, linked to is Islam. And it was actually very surprising that we got a huge amount of questions and people got really engaged. And we started recording um, a, a, an episode basically where we um, answered some of those questions. And because of the level of engagement, um, Greenpeace decided to turn this um, one trial to a whole series of episodes that will run for the next couple of months. So I think, when you realize, like when you find the right way to talk to people, you will actually understand, you actually realize that they're interested in the topic. They just never managed to get to them 
and, um, and use the language. So I think this is what I've learned over the years. And um, I'm hoping that I will continue to work with amazing people and collaborate with awesome people like Eric, Nabila, Tom, and all of you. So back to you, Tom. Yes, I was just going to say, if we could have a round of applause for our wonderful panelists. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, that was a really wonderful presentation. I do believe we have 19 minutes left for Q&A, if anyone has any questions. Well, you know, Lena, something you said uh, made me curious about kind of like the for-profit industry that is journalism. Like at the, end of the, at the end of the day, newspapers always want to be making money. And sometimes that might be at odds with like sharing the most pertinent stories about climate change. So how have you three kind of dealt with that issue? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me personally, what I try to do is um, I, I told editors like, um, give me a chance to write this article and see if, if it gets any engagement. And that's because I was confident in, in the audience that I was speaking to, and I knew that um, I might get engagement. But also, I think uh, one of the ways that I is I try to convince the editor, or at least uh, as you like uh, as as journalism needs to advocate. So, uh, like I just try to convince them, but it's really difficult. Like it's not the easiest task, I would say. Uh, I would just say that um, I think it takes quite, um, we had quite a lot of pushback at doing a climate change campaign. You know, we're journalists, we don't do campaigns at The Guardian. And um, we document that in the podcast, people who are skeptical, people who are just like, you know, there are other things happening in the world. Um, but I think it was better late than never. And the most important thing about it, I really think when it comes to climate communication is you do start reaching different kinds of people. It does start entering people's minds, but you're constantly now reflecting on what I showed you in my slideshow. It looks a bit sort of very much the sort of privilege of who we were and, you know, with all the money that we had. And I guess we made a bit of a dent because the, the mood changed, right? I mean, Paris, that was a good agreement that we, that we made at that climate summit. You know, the Pope was suddenly talking about environment and his encyclical. You start to see a whole mood turning and I think the most important thing is that you have a platform. How are you going to use it? And that's something that with Eric, you know, we've been working on over the last year with his particular messaging around, you know, that we are living in a climate emergency. And so I think you take that privilege and you use it for the best. Yeah, I would just say, you know, as someone who recently started an independent um, publication, um, money definitely um is important um but i think that for the for-profit model is not the only model um i think you know i i'm doing a completely subscription driven um model right now so so in some way like going full circle back to what lena said um is that if you can can find and identify an audience that cares and if you can speak to them and learn how to connect with them then you will find people who are willing to support you uh, financially or through sharing or collaboration or giving you a chance, like Lena said, giving you a chance to just see, just let me write this thing. Uh, and I promise you it will have a good impact because I just know, I know my audience really well. And, um, and that is what has happened, you know, for me um, in terms of, of, um, having uh, people support me directly instead of um, me being paid by uh, a news organization now. So, um, it, you know, it works for some people, um, especially it works for people who have been lucky enough to be able to be given space to cultivate their own audience. Well, thank you. I believe Cameron has a question. Yep. Hi, yeah, thanks so much. Um... So it, like in the short time that I've really been involved in, you know, environmental journalism or reading it, I feel like I'm reading more and more stories about solutions and mm -hmm. bright spots and, and wins. Um, although the stories about, um, you know, the dangers of climate change and trying to mobilize people through alarm still definitely exists. Um, I wonder about your take on, for, for, for all three of you, your take on the balance between mobilizing people to care, you know, signifying that alarm is valid, and then giving people hope. 
um, and highlighting solutions. Like I think that's a hard balance to strike and, and I wonder about your take on that. Uh, I mean, really quickly, my, my um, perspective is that there are people that already care. Like, you know, people like Nabila um, have done the work over the last uh, several years to cultivate that huge audience, you know, um, the Green New Deal right now is one of the most um, popular policy ideas in the United States, for example. Um, there are, uh, I think it was like 32% of Republicans um, in the election that just finished said that climate change was a top priority of the country. So uh, there are a huge, I mean, that's, you know, 20 million people right there, uh, just Republicans that care about climate change. So, um, so there, there is a huge audience for who, whatever it is, whatever story it is that you're trying to tell, there's a huge audience for it. Um, and I would say that um, we don't need to sort of resort to the sort of like screaming into the night <laughs> perspectives that like feel like climate journalism for the last like 10 to 20 years was a lot of just like, hey, we're all dying, <laughs> please like, <laughs> please care. <laughs> like, I don't think that that, I think that has passed. I think that we are now solidly into the like, there is not enough climate journalists for the amount of information that needs to be uh, told or amount of stories that need to be told. Like there's a built-in audience now for climate stories that you can sort of get right to the nuts and bolts of what is the story? What is the the specific audience that I want to talk about? And and doing it in a rigorous way that doesn't sort of resort to yelling, basically. Just to build up on what Eric said, I think I also uh, when I started writing about climate change at first, um, I was yeah I was kind of like trying to warn people about the consequences and how bad things might get. But now I kind of slowly started shifting into what can we do because I feel like the, the audience that I speak to has already been alarmed about climate change and now they are in the phase where they want to do something about it. So what can we do? What can you as an individual do? What do we want from our government and so on? So I think uh, it's about establishing the audience and then slowly moving towards solutions either on an individual level or like a collective level. It's the number one question that I get from readers is what can I do? Um, that's, I mean, that's what people wanna know. Yeah, totally. And I mean, if I tell you that we ran a climate change campaign at The Guardian, the answer might then be, did you succeed? And maybe journalists find it horrifying that, you know, the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation did not dispose of all of their fossil fuel investments. Some of them, I mean, Wellcome Trust at least increased some, even though they took some money out here and there. And I think Bill Gates remains skeptical about the theory of change that disinvestment can bring and what you can actually do that's better for, for actually fighting climate change. Um, but that that none of us took that as a fail um, because of all of the things that we achieved along the way. And so, you know, hundreds of readers were writing letters to the Wellcome Trust board, you know, requesting divestment. They were inquiring about their own pension funds and what their own money and their jobs is going into. You know, they were joining us in video appeals and like health professionals, I think a thousand of them, including the editors of The Lancet and the British Medical Journal, um, you know, signed a letter urging, you know, health organizations to divest their assets. So, um, and actually, how can The Guardian launch a divestment campaign when its own savings are bound up in fossil fuels? And so luckily the commercial board then did take the decision to divest its own 800 million um, fund from coal, oil and gas. And so I feel like ever since then, five years on, the grassroots has only got stronger. Um, and we keep seeing pension funds and the Church of England and Stanford University and the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, you know, taking their money out of, um, of fossil fuels. And there was a part two for the campaign. And actually, I was just I was just double checking that I had the wording right. But indeed, the we continued it for a while. And it was just like, join our campaign and help spread a message of hope so that the world can stop climate change, join us. And the focus was then on renewable energies. So we did then pivot from that very hard, big ask really to do with money and to do with the power that companies and states have and this interconnected, interconnectability that they have and how that relates to the science 
and then moving it on to what is actually working. So I think everything is an evolution, but getting people involved and having them act in their ways, which makes sense to them is great. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit because that's fascinating to me that that you're all seemingly more more and more commonly emphasizing um, the hope and kind of what we would call in the social science world efficacy um, that individual readers can get from reading about solutions that are accessible to them in their own lives. And that makes a lot of sense, but it's also part of this sort of neoliberal uh, trend, right? Where with this emphasis on individual action. And yet, Nabila, you were just talking about, you know, the power of the state and corporations and that that's, those are necessary influences, you know, sort of paths of influence um, and change that are just as important at kind of this more structural level. And I'm just curious, since you're all working in different parts of the world, um, with different kind of political systems that are more or less open, you know, to advocacy from uh, individuals and organizations, you know, how that plays out in the field of the kind of writing, reporting, and journalism that you're doing. I guess I'm particularly curious, um, you know, in the Sudan, how that plays out. Are you you know, is your voice welcome at, 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 are you welcome to speak and report on structural level change that may be required? Or is it, is it, um, you know, are you kind of, you know, kept at this level where you're reporting more on what individuals can do and households can do in their own lives to address climate change and mitigate it and adapt to it? Can you speak to that a little bit, Lena? And then maybe the others can also chime in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. For for bringing that up. That actually one of the, uh, the challenges that I faced once I started writing on a world national level about climate change is that um, Sudan up until um, 2019, we had an authoritarian government and like a dictatorship government that been there for 30 years. And um, it only got toppled down after the 2019 uh, revolution in Sudan. So up until 2019, I actually wasn't able at all to speak about what the government should do about climate change and even the corruption that was happening when it comes to climate projects and environmental projects. So and my article would always get edited and toned down a bit when I tried to mention structural change. And sometimes I even had when I did write articles about how we need to do structural change when it comes to climate change and the way the government approach it. I had to publish my article under a fake name or on news outside on newspaper outside the government outside Sudan and that's because for my own safety I could not do this so Right now, like an, uh, after the revolution uh, and the recent political openings, uh, media freedom has changed a lot and has um, improved a lot in Sudan. So I've finally been able to actually write about what should we do from a, like a governmental perspective, what the government should need to work on. And because the new government right now that we have is quite um, open, uh, it's a transitional government that will stay here for three years, but they've already expressed um, how climate change is one of their top priorities. Uh, so they've been very welcoming of what, uh, if any ideas from individuals or media. So I think this has been a huge change and I got lucky uh, with that one for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's absolutely been, um, been um, kind of frustrating and also scary at some points when I was reporting about climate change and what, what needs to happen. Yeah, it's that, yeah, it definitely changed a lot. And I just want to jump in and say, you're amazing, Lena, because Sudan had an incredible <laughs> revolution for a whole year. So you couldn't go to uni and then the pandemic started. So you couldn't go to uni. And so I feel incredibly lucky that I met you in at, like around a little table at the climate summit in Bonn and got introduced to this girl. And I just think you're very modest and the work that you're doing is really, really powerful, incredible. Thank you. Very impressive indeed. Um, I guess just to follow up on that, um, I, I'm aware on the Zoom that we have several uh, students or extremely recent graduates of the Yale School of the Environment who have focused um, some of their training uh, and scholarship on um, reporting and on, on trying to develop as journalists. And so I'm just curious what you would what kind of advice you have for this upcoming generation? I know Lena, you're definitely, you know, in the thick of it and really part of that. Um, what advice would you have for, uh, for these young people that are just now, 
you know, trying to trying to figure out and craft their own careers um, that include, you know, writing and reporting and, and communicating on climate. Anybody want to take yeah, I mean, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to go again, but uh, basically, uh, I think one advice would be is that whenever you want to write about um, something related to environment or climate change, don't just write about it. Think about the impact that you want to have with that article or that um, um, podcast or that movie that you want to produce and how you ha and the audience that you want to reach. Because I think once you actually think of ask yourself those questions, like who am I reaching out to? How am I reaching out to them? And what do I want to convince someone uh, with? And like, what do I want them to do after they read my article, for example? I think it becomes very clear for you how you want to communicate and who are you even communicating with? I think that, that really helps you better understand what to do and basically have a more impactful, um, more impactful work when it comes to writing, I would say. But Eric definitely and Nabila have way more useful insight, insights. Go on, Eric, you're unmuted. <laughs> I guess so. Um, I, I, I really think, I mean, the first thing I was gonna say was um, don't be afraid to follow your passion of what it, um, you know, Honestly, like this work is so hard, like emotionally, spiritually challenging work um, of talking about um, existential change, really. Uh, that's what our job is. And, um, and I think that you sort of owe it to yourself and your readers to write about what's gonna get you out of bed in the morning, write about what you're excited to write about um, because that's gonna come across in um, in the words, you know, like pe people will read it and they will realize that you are excited to write it and then they will be excited to read it. Um, and also it's going to help your, you know, mental health. Uh, it will help keep you going. It will help, uh, you to stay motivated to do this work because we need all of you, uh, and more <laughs> to, uh, stay, um, to stay engaged and to uh, not give up uh, because this is something where I feel like uh, in an average week, there are a handful of times where I'm just like, okay, that's it. I'm just going to quit because it's just too much. Um, it's a lot to hold and it's a lot to, um, it's a lot to deal with. Um, and I'm sure I could write about something that's a little bit less stressful, <laughs> but um but I, I know you go back to what um, Nabila said is like, this is the most important story of our time. And we're alive at this very, very critical moment in history. And we all on this call have um, a certain amount of knowledge that we really, I think, have a responsibility and duty to, to use um, to improve uh, the lives of other people through our journalism as much as we can. I would just add one last thing to that, which is that I was so shocked that I passed my interview at The Guardian to join the climate change campaign. I think at one point they were like, what do you think about fossil fuels? And I was like, uh, they're old. You know, it was just like, so I, I, I don't um, pretend that I find this an easy topic as a sort of generalist, but somebody who's had the luck to specialize in it. And I think use that to your advantage and don't feel stressed by it. There's there's always so much to learn. And, and as you learn and go along with it, you're gonna be presenting it to different audiences in different ways. And both Lena and Eric have said, at some point you'll also understand who those audiences are and what they want. And so I use that as a sort of guiding light um, as I go along with this, with this process. So yeah, have fun with it. And thank you so much for having us. Yeah, well, thank, thank you guys you. so much for being here. Um, it is 11, so if no one has any other questions, I think it's about time to wrap up. But if we could get another round of applause for our wonderful panelists today. You know, I, I really do think it's um, panelists like you guys who add a, a really interesting perspective to our work here at the YPCCC and really give everyone at the forestry school kind of like a, a very professional look at a lot of environmental fields. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I guess we can close out. I would also like to invite everyone here back next week. We will be having um, another talk with a professor named John Abraham, who works on the Rapid, Cli Rapid Science Climate Response Team. So that will be very interesting. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye, everyone.
Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, thank you bye. so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya.